Hey, good morning. I think I'll make a start. So just um, for those of you who've just arrived, uh, we're going to be using this interactive uh, website for um, today's lecture and for the lectures into the future. So in order to be able to participate in this, I think some of you have probably used this before. The name of the website is Mentimeter. You simply go to that link on your phone or other device, so not on the computer that you're um, watching this, um, and you enter into the code. So a couple of slides, we're going to be having some interactive component, um, which I will explain to you later on. Uh, so, so welcome to the racial state. I'm very excited to see you here. It would be nicer to have um, a face-to-face -face lecture, but unfortunately that's the nature of the modern university in the post-COVID era. My name is Alana Lenton. I'm a professor in the School of Humanities and Communication Arts. I recognize some names. Some of you may have seen me before last year uh, on my other unit, which is called Politics, Power and Resistance. I'm really happy to see you um, back here. Um, and we are going to be discussing a range of topics, which I'll introduce to you as we go on. Firstly, let me acknowledge that we are currently on the diverse lands of Aboriginal peoples of the Eora Nation. It would be really nice if you could share in the chat where you are currently sitting today. I personally am joining you on the, um, from the unceded lands of the Darug people, and I would like to pay my respects to their elders past and present, and also, of course, to extend that respect to any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people who are with us uh, today. And I use this occasion, often these days, acknowledgements of country become very um, sort of prosaic, like we hear them all the time, which is interesting because we didn't hear them so often before. However, I really want to ensure that we understand the meaning of acknowledging country. And for myself, I want to use this little moment to remind myself and all of us here that what, wherever we are, whatever country we are on, this always was and always will be Aboriginal land. On top of that, universities are, of course, built on sovereign Aboriginal lands. And beyond the campus which I'm sitting on today, which is Kingswood Campus, the Western, Uni sorry, Western Sydney University is built on the lands of the Darug, the Tharawal, the Eora and the Wiradjuri nations. And as students and educators, it's worth remembering that universities have been and continue to be complicit with ongoing colonization. So this is going to be a major theme that we discuss together um, throughout the course of the semester. So when we talk to each other, it's important to think about the role that each of us has in upholding the status quo and to think about what we might personally do to bring about change. Personally, uh, I'm not sure I always succeed, but I try to incorporate a critical reflection on my own role as someone who is a migrant settler on unceded Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander lands, the benefits that accrue to me as a result, and how I can use the space of the classroom, be it the virtual classroom as we're in together today now, or later on in face-to-face -to -face tutorials to question why things are the way they are, and to try to think about how we can bring about some form of justice. Okay, so today's lecture is my opportunity to give you an overview of what we're going to be doing throughout the semester. But before I want to do that, I'm going to uh, try to guide you through how I understand uh, race. And race is a topic that I've been working on for a really long time, and I can't say that I'm anywhere near the bottom of understanding it. So I'm saying this to you as somebody who's, as I say, probably worked on this for over 20 years, uh, 25 years if I include going back to my Malsis thesis, and earlier as somebody who's always been involved in anti-racism activism, both in Europe before moving to this place, and while since I've lived here, which is almost 11 years now, um, I've tried to understand what race is, but I, it's, it's a really, really complex topic. And I think part of the problem when we discuss race is that we kind of think we know what it is um, and we're not always on the same page. So what I'm going to do, I'm not arguing that there's only one way to think about race, 
but because uh, I have the prerogative of uh, guiding this um, this uh, seminar series with you or this lecture series rather with you, then I get to say what my take on it is. And I'm going to try to convince you that I think it's a, it's a viable way of thinking about race, but of course, other people will have different ideas and we can respectfully discuss those together. Now, before I go into trying to outline to you how I think about race and why I think it's a viable idea, I want to say that I don't expect anybody to come away from today's lecture going, yep, got it, it's fine, I know what it is, right? You're not going to do that. I've already, and I'm stressing this point because, um, because it is so complex that it's taken me so many years to have a basic understanding and I still don't think that my understanding is complete. So please don't be um, annoyed with yourselves or frustrated if you come away from today going, I literally have no idea what that woman was talking about. <laughs> okay, I'm going to try to be as straightforward as I can, but it is not something that is very easy to understand, right? So that's fine. And that's the way it should be because if it was easy to understand, we would have done away with all of the domination, exploitation and discrimination that results because of race, right? It would be easy peasy, done and dusted, and we'd have moved on to the next topic. And it's not like that, right? So that's one thing I want to say. All right, so I'm going to be laying uh, out, um, sorry, sorry, laying the ground for the rest of the semester. Um, I'm going to be talking also about, well, I'm going to be introducing to you what my working definition of race is um, and some others. And then I'm going to briefly discuss two common ideas that are out there in the world about what race is. And I'm going to try to problematize those ideas a little bit, right? Uh, and just to, to get you to sort of to be introduced to my way of thinking on this. And I suppose I should say, um, I don't really like to, <laughs> I don't really like to um, go on about my credentials, but you might be going, well, who is she to be telling us what this stuff is? Well, I've written about, well, I've written four books on race. Um, I've, uh, those are monograph, what we call monographs, so books solely written by me, where well, one is co-authored with somebody else. Um, I've written also edited collections, so books involving different authors. Um, and I have written many journal articles and book chapters on the topic and have been involved in many conferences and seminars. And as I said, also come from a background of anti-racist activism. So I have some experience, right? So that's where I'm coming from. And I've spent a really long time thinking about these things. So the two ideas I want to problematize together with you is first, the idea that race is something that is socially constructed. And you may have heard about this idea, and I'm going to be really interested to discuss with you what you think this means and whether or not you think that's a useful way of looking at things. And the other thing I want to discuss is the common idea that's out there in the world that really, when it comes down to it, racism is a problem of individuals. Um, so individual people who are racist, right? And that we could overcome this in a number of ways. Uh, one could be, well, getting rid of people's ignorance by educating them better, or for example, getting people from different cultural backgrounds to get to know each other better. So that assumption comes from the idea that we were racist towards other people because we don't know them well enough. And I'm going to be trying to debunk those two ideas, right? Um, we're also going to be talking briefly about the ethics that guide this subject, um, some ethical principles, and um, what to expect as the semester goes on. So what are we going to be studying? And I also want to say to you, before I move on, please don't worry because um, everything is provided to you on view. So the full lecture notes, slides and notes in PDF form. So you can always go back and read this. And there'll also be the recording available if you miss a lecture or if you cannot attend at this time. So don't be too stressed about taking down all the notes and um, you know, making sure you keep up. I'd rather that you listened and just take a few notes where that's useful to you. Okay. All right, so the first thing I want to do is get us to test out this, um, this interactive technology for the first time and see how if it works, right? Um, and that is going to be through um, what this question. So what do you think that race means or what does race mean to you? Okay, and I think it should work. Um, you should be able to fill in any word that comes to mind 
when you think of the word race. If you cannot do this, it's because I haven't set it up properly. So please, you know, shout out and tell me, no, it's not working. And then we won't necessarily do it this time and I'll, I'll make it work for next time. If it is working, we should start to see people's words coming up on the screen. Oh, there we go, great. So we've got ethnic people and a classifying system, biology, ooh, lots of nice things here coming up, language, ethnicities, background, physical attributes, heritage, power, that was in the title of the lecture, so that's good. <laughs> um, racism, great. Uh, what else do we have? It's good to see that the um, politicized, yes. It's good to see that the tech is working at least. All right, so we've got a range of different things up here on the screen, which are all relevant, all very interesting. Um, does anybody feel comfortable yet just sharing with us why they put down what they put down, just so I get a sense of who's in the room. It's very hard when we're online with each other to sort of connect. Anybody feel comfortable? Don't have to, as it's the first lecture, I'm not going to force you. But if you do want to, then please use the raise hand function or just, just go. Yes, Talia? Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Sorry, I can't put a camera on at the moment. I don't have one okay. on the computer. I put down classifying system. And okay. I feel like that's probably not capturing what I think. But I did that, speaking back to what you mentioned about race being, whether it is a social construct or not, I think that it is. But I think that that oversimplifies the issue. But ultimately, I do think that race itself is just a way to classify people. Okay, well, that's great. A great start. Does anybody else want to say anything before I jump in with a comment? Okay, so I think Talia's really offered us a really good um, a really good definition, or at least one attribute of what race is. And we will be talking about race as a system for classifying people. Um, we sort of understand that. And I'll, I don't want to go into it in too much detail now, because I'll be explaining that a little later on. But I guess the one question I want you to think about already from now is, OK, it's a system for classifying people, but why? <laughs> right. Why do we need to classify people? Right. That's a question that I want you to think about. Now, we classify everything. And there are historical reasons for why we do this. Um, it's a methodology, if we want to get into the history, it's a methodology that we can basically trace back to the Enlightenment, right? So people have heard of the Enlightenment, kind of new um, you know, way, system of, of thought that we can um, trace back to the 17th century. Um, when scientists and philosophers and so on started to think that it was necessary to be able to systematize everything around us, be it plants, animals, and also human beings. But that still doesn't explain to us exactly why, right? So this is the nub of the question. Why would we need to classify people? Maybe we need to classify plants, right? But do we need to classify people? What is it for, right? Are these things equitable? Can we think about human beings in the same way that we think about the natural and the physical world, all right? So these are questions that will come up as we go along. So as, as we're already um, seeing, oh, sorry. Yes, as we're already seeing, um, race is not necessarily straightforward. We had a variety of things put down on the board. They were all relevant, right? But they were different, or some of them were the same, but some of them were different, right? So some people put down ethnicity or ethnic groups, and some people put down biology and physical characteristics. And you might say, well, what have these two things got to do with each other, right? Sometimes they have something to do with each other, but often they don't have anything to do with each other. So people from the same ethnic group might look very different to each other, for example, right? So already we're getting, hmm, there's lots of different things going on, right? So basically there are many competing understandings of race that often seem wildly different to each other. So let's put down some first principles that will help us to um, understand these things better. The first thing I want to impress upon you is that race is not a thing. So it's not, it's not something that is something. It is something that does something, right? Now, that might seem very confusing, but hopefully this will become clearer. 
race, as we saw from the various words that were put up on the board, becomes attached to the body, right? So people talked about physical attributes. And it is also associated with people's identity. So people might say, I belong to X race, or I am this race, or even if you want to use more sophisticated language, I am racialized as XXX. And we'll talk about what racialization means next week. So don't worry too much. But I want to impress upon you that although this happens, race becomes attached to bodies, race becomes attached to identities, but it is not the same as identity, right? So race and identity have been made synonymous, but they are not the same. Race is something that does something. It is not something that is something. Now, that might sound a bit weird, but I'm going to suggest to you that this is the best way of thinking about race. All right. so. In order to try to get us to understand what I mean here, for my last book, uh, Why Race Still Matters, I developed this uh, definition of race and other people have also used this definition or a similar definition. Um, and I'll just read it out, although you can see it on the board. I argue that race is a technology of power for the management of human difference. And the main goal of this technology of power is to produce, reproduce, and maintain white supremacy at both a local level and, I've said a fancy word here, planetary, but we could say global level, right, across the world, right? So there's a few different things going on in this definition. So let me just try to break it down for you. The first thing is, well, what do I mean by a technology? Actually, let me put the question out there. I haven't made a slide for this, but does anybody feel comfortable to define technology for me? You can write it in the chat or you can say it out loud. Or you don't have to. I can say what. <laughs> Yulita? Hi. Hi. Um, just kind of reading it in the sentence, my mind kind of went to like race is almost like a vessel of power. So it's mm -hmm. like um, a way to get to yes. a certain goal. Perfect. Absolutely brilliant. That's exactly right, right? The point about the word technology is that it's not, again, it's not a thing, right? It, it doesn't exist in and of itself, right? If we think of a phone, obviously it's an object, right? But it's only um, important because it allows us to do different things, right? It allows us to call, it allows us to text, it allows us to browse on the internet and so on and so forth, right? So it has a function or a range of functions. So a technology is a tool or a range of tools for doing something. So the definition that I formulated, which I've borrowed from different people, bits of, bits of it I've borrowed from different people. Some of those authors are Wendy Chun, Falguni Sheit, um, others also. This, I think, helps us to further understand exactly what Yulita was saying, why race does something. So why is it a vessel for doing something or a technology for doing something rather than being something? I argue that race is a tool that works together with other tools. What are those other tools? Whether they are things like the law, policy making, policing, very obvious examples, surveillance, borders, right? So why do we have a border when we enter a state and so on? Um, state and non-state institutions of various kinds, and we'll be exploring those kinds of institutions later on in the semester. All of these things, which enact practices of various kinds in order to separate between people for the purpose, and this comes back to your comment, Talia, about classification, what is the purpose? The purpose of classifying, dividing, and managing people is in order to dominate and exploit them better, right? Or to dominate and exploit them. So this shows that race is something that is always open to transformation, because if it is not a thing in itself, it obviously can be changed up, right? Race, which basically implies their idea that there is an intrinsic difference between groups of people, has no basis in science, right? There's been lots of research that's conclusively shown that the idea of there being distinct biological differences between groups who have been organized into races is bogus, right? There is no such difference. So we need to think beyond this idea of biology. And to understand race, we have to think about it as a range of adaptable 
technologies or tools or vessels, if you like, for ensuring domination and exploitation, right? So it's the doing part, the technologies, the tools, the functions, the processes and practices that we are interested in, and they can change over time. Now, as we'll see next week when we examine the process of racialization, and let's just park that word for now because that's a whole other ball game that we'll talk about next week, this can lead to people or whole groups, obviously, as I said before, identifying with the racial category with which they have been assigned. So again, just to repeat, race may become identity, but it does not begin with identity and is not equal to identity. And Above all, when we talk about the functions of race in the current era, race is a tool for ensuring white dominance or supremacy, both within local contexts, such as a nation state, uh, or on the global scale. And we will be talking in week three about what whiteness is and what white supremacy is. And it doesn't necessarily mean white people, right? This is another, it's a system of power. So just park that for the moment, right? The point is, however, that the purpose of race is to ensure white dominance or white supremacy across a whole range of axes, right? So this can be in the range, in the realm of politics, in the realm of the law, in the realm of knowledge, right? Lots of different areas. And that's why it needs to be constantly maintained. And in order to maintain race and ensure that it is produced and reproduced because it serves a number of important functions, we use or a range of state of sorry of tools or technologies are used and part of what we're going to be doing is exploring what those tools and technologies are now i realize i've spent a lot of time saying some introductory things so i've really got to move on uh, a little bit quicker right so this definition i also like and it's from a new book which i gave you the reading from um also for this week in the additional reading it's very nice simple book which i recommend everybody looks at by uh, Shafi and Nagdi, and they say that race is a social system. It marks out the structural relationship of certain social groups to power and to processes of exploitation and indexes, divisions of labor and social control. So they're emphasizing also the social nature of race. So it's not just a tool of political power, it creates an entire social system and works both across institutions and at the level of people and individuals, so the interpersonal level, if you want to use that language. So basically, both my definition and Shafi and Nagdi's emphasize race as a tool of power. This is in order to divide and exploit people on the grounds of made up divisions that are said to make them different from each other in an essential way. All right, so I did want to consult you, but I'm going to go on because of time. All right, so just to recap, race is at its core an idea, an idea that, it, that is used to organize and manage groups of people at the level of populations, in other words, not just individuals, but whole groups, with a view to exploiting them in various ways. So race doesn't stand alone from power, the state, the colonial system, and capitalism, it's linked to these systems. But of course, there are debates about where race comes from, where does it originate? So for many scholars of race, race is a modern phenomenon. Now, modernity is dated differently, but we can say more or less around the um, beginning of this or the end of the 16th century, you start to have the beginning of the era that's known as the modern era, but don't worry about that too much. So people who um, take this approach, argue that contrary to many people's beliefs, race is not something that's always been around, but it developed under specific conditions. And they argue that race emerges with the modern era because at this time you have the growth in secularism, in other words, challenge to religion, particularly Christianity in Europe. So the a challenge particularly to the idea of, of God's creation and this beginning of an idea that you know, everybody believed in that in those days. So the beginning of people starting to think, well, maybe we weren't all created in the image of God. So as soon as you open the door to thinking that not everybody is created in the image of God, the next stage is to think, well, maybe we have different origins, right? Maybe all human beings who look different to each other and come from different areas of the world actually are not all made the same, right? And this is one important, um, important kind of direction that uh, race takes. 
At this time, you also have, as I mentioned earlier, the growth of science, um, enlightenment philosophy. With that, you have the development of the idea of rational and irrational thinking, right? And irrational thinking was attached to people who were not European and white. You also have the beginning of the nation state. With the beginning of the nation state in Europe, you have the need to be able to organize who lives in the nation state, right? Who your citizens are, what the different groups are, who does what work, and so on and so forth. And of course, vitally, you have at this time the beginning of colonial expansion. So Europeans going around the world and uh, invading and dominating territories uh, of other people. Now, of course, this idea, the idea that race is modern is very important because it challenges the belief that race is natural or that it's just a fact of life, which is something that many people believe. In other words, if race can be shown to have emerged at a specific time in history, then we can also see a future in which it is no longer important. So that's really, really important, right? However, a growing number of scholars, and I'm somebody who used to say, well, race is just modern, but I've been quite convinced by this new, newer work, particularly the work of Geraldine Heng, whose book I've put up here on the screen. Uh, she wrote a book called The Invention of Race in the Middle Ages. She says that the reason why we think of race as being modern is because we associate it too closely with science. So all those developments that I spoke about earlier. Race is associated with science, especially biology and later genetics. Things that I'm sure you've heard of, like Charles Darwin's theory of evolution and the spin-off of that. So it's social Darwinism, so the idea of the survival of the fittest taken from the animal world into the human world. And of course, eugenics or racial hygiene or this notion that we have to perfect the human race. And in order to perfect the human race, what do we do? Well, we might kill off people who are not quote unquote perfect. And of course, to use the most famous uh, historical example, this uh, was the practice of the Nazis against disabled people first and later on Jews and other people who they considered to be um, subhuman, right? But, Heng says, and others agree, race is more than this. Race looks uh, quite far back into the Middle Ages at, for example, the vilification and extermination of Jews in Europe to show how religion, Christianity obviously, was used to, as she put it, classify people in absolute and fundamental ways. Again, this is why Talia's comment was important. And we can also see the impact of religion on Islamophobic racism to this day. Another theorist whose work we're going to be using a lot this semester, Stuart Hall, also argued that science was the last stage in the development of race. So before people even invented scientific means for thinking, uh, for you know, developing uh, theories of race, so what we refer to as racial science, you had other ways or other mechanisms that were used to create these divisions and classifications. The first I've already referred to, which is, of course, religion. Um, this was the main mechanism used to distinguish between Christians and non-Christians. And why was this important? It wasn't just because Christians didn't like other people. It wasn't really about that. But it was about establishing Europe as the domain of Christendom. This was the word that was used. And this idea that Europe was intrinsically a Christian space. In other words, a continent for Christian people. And this, of course, why did they want to, you know, bed down the idea of Europe as a Christian space? Well, because, of course, for large parts of the 14th and 15th century, Muslim rulers ruled over large areas of Europe. And it became important to throw off Muslim rule by asserting this idea of a unified Europe united in its affiliation to Christianity. The next stage Stuart Hall talks about is geography. So race later becomes associated with people's geographic location. People from different parts of the world were said to have different racial origins. And this is very common in the way we still think about race today. Um, we less, think less about religion, although it's still important, particularly with regards to Muslims. But we do think about geography. So this idea was used in conjunction with ideas of religious incompatibility to justify the domination by Europeans over other lands, 
leading to the installation of colonial rule in those spaces. And the last stage only, as I said earlier, was biology, which was then used to justify classifying whole groups of people as being wholly different to each other and even killing them en masse. Racial classification, eugenics, but also later biomedicine, so medicine and other techniques like, for example, intelligence testing, IQ, were all tools that were used to create the idea that there was something intrinsic or natural or inherent to different bodies that made people naturally different to each other. And as we'll see over the weeks, abhorrent practices of violence on people's bodies. Um, and don't worry, I'll be, I'll be, you know, warning you when we talk about these things because they are sometimes very difficult to stomach. Were justified in the name of science and medicine in particular. So the important thing to take away here is that race uses a range of ideas about intrinsic human difference. So they could be cultural, they could be religious, ethnic, genetic, or associated with the body in some way, national, and so on. So we can talk about a process um, being racial, when differences between human beings are taken to be fundamental, absolute, and insurmountable, and used to justify the domination of some by others. However, as we'll see, this isn't something that's universal. The conditions for developing the idea of race were the conditions of early modern Europe, where various developments, in particular, the development of capitalism and the birth of the nation state, as I said earlier, were ripe for the emergence of racial ideas. So this gets us to the heart, or we start to unpick this question of why, right? Why do we need to classify people? What is the purpose of doing so. And again, I know I'm throwing a lot of ideas out here, but we'll, as the weeks go on, we'll understand them better. All right. So along this line, another key thinker is Cedric Robinson. And Cedric Robinson was quite opposed to this idea that was common, as I said earlier, that race was merely a modern phenomenon. He was perplexed by this idea that race somehow suddenly becomes such an important factor for many people only after the birth of colonialism in the 15th century or the late 15th century and, particular, and particularly the sl transatlantic slave trade. So probably if most of us were to think about one thing, that one historical phenomenon that we associate the most with race, we would say slavery, right? The transatlantic slave trade. But Robinson is going, how did they come up with this idea just all of a sudden, right? It must have come from somewhere. And that's what he does. He looks into it. So in order to try to uncover why race is used in order to justify the enslavement of so many people for the purposes of enriching Western states, right? He looks at the origins of race within Europe itself. And he says that race was already an idea and a practice that was available and therefore could be adapted to new circumstances. So similar to Heng's idea, who looks particularly at the situation of Jews in England in the Middle Ages, um, and she looks at other examples also, Robinson does a similar job. So his idea is quite challenging to many people, because actually, if you take, if you go to the logical conclusion of his argument, he detaches race from skin color and black African people in particular. Um, and that's something that we find difficult because we often associate race with blackness. And indeed, racism and anti-blackness have become synonymous for very particular reasons historically. But he wants to show us that through colonialism and, sorry, start again, although colonialism and the slave trade, uh, race comes to be predominantly used as a tool to dominate and exploit black and indigenous people. However, before that, in the Europe of the Middle Ages, it developed initially along with the early days of capitalism as a way of dividing among different groups of people who lived in Europe, right, in order to apportion them to different kinds of work, right? So let's not get too involved in the argument. It's relatively complex, but because of the, the growing need of the early capitalist system to be able to organize groups of people as different kind of workers, you start to say, well, 
these people are naturally, uh, you know, should naturally be doing this kind of work. And these other people can nat should naturally be doing this other kind of work. And this third group should be slaves, right? We shouldn't pay them anything at all, right? So obviously these practices became common over time in the European context. And different people were enslaved at different times. It wa wasn't always the same people. And people were also forced to migrate around the continent for reasons such as famine very often or labor scarcity. And under those conditions of adversity, they were often used as slaves, right? So later on, these practices Robinson impresses upon us, which already existed in the European context, were rolled out in the colonial context, first to indigenous peoples in the Americas. So we're talking about, you know, what we call today South America, the Caribbean, and only later North America, right? Um, and later on, so first indigenous peoples who were found there and just basically put to work by Europeans. And as the trades increase, and particularly things like the sugar trade, which is absolutely immense, right? They simply needed so many people to work this. And the cheapest way to make as much money as possible from sugar was obviously to get people to work for free. That's at that point when they went to Africa and captured people and enslaved them and exported millions and millions of people all over the Americas. And Cedric Robinson calls this system, which emerges first in Europe, he calls it racial capitalism. So I won't go on too much, but in this quote, he wants us to understand that what he calls racialism, so that's his way of saying racism, uh, which is basically the organization of society on the basis of the idea that different races exist, can only be understood by understanding the way European civilization developed at a specific time. So that time is just after the Middle Ages and the birth of capitalism, which happened at this time. And so his argument is that we need to understand this because capitalism spread across the globe through the colonial domination of the rest of the world by Europeans. And Europeans, in so doing, brought with them this way of organizing society on the basis of racial differences, which, as I'm trying to impress upon you, is first and foremost a tool of power. So for those at the top of society to be able to better manage the people who they control by saying, well, you belong to this group and you belong to that group and this third group belong over here. Understanding this is key to understanding why race continues to be such a force. So you're already getting to see that colonialism as a system of power is fundamental to the exportation or the spread of race across the globe. A key date is obviously 1492, which is the year in which the Americas were first invaded on behalf of the Spanish crowns and Spanish king. Um, and Queen sends Christopher Columbus, I'm sure you've all heard of, to do his dirty deeds. At the same time, in Spain itself, the Spanish were holding inquisitions based on the notion of purity of blood and forcing Jews and Muslims to either convert to Christianity or to go into exile, so to leave Spain. At the same time, indigenous people whose lands were invaded by the Spanish and Portuguese uh, because they were non-Christians, were questioned as to whether or not they were truly human. So the question for the Spanish became, can a heathen, right, somebody who's not a Christian, really be a human being? So this is the point to return to the earlier question of where religion gets mixed up together with race. A key historical moment in the development of this was uh, the so-called Valladolid debate between Sepulveda and de las Casas. And you can, you can look this up later on. Uh, there are various videos that explain it but very, very briefly. This is a theological debate between two you know, religious thinkers that was called by the Spanish king on the rights and treatment of indigenous people in 1550. So it's interesting, so far back in history, people were already thinking about these questions. How do we relate to and how do we treat indigenous people? On the one hand of the debate, you had Sepulveda, and he argued that indigenous people uh, who were called Indians at this time could be enslaved because they were unable to govern themselves and that it was possible to 
you know, as he put it, subdue them by war. In other words, the violence against them was justified, right? On the other hand, de las Casas used religious arguments to claim that every individual was obliged to prevent innocent people from being treated unjustly. And he was motivated because what he wanted to do was include indigenous people into Christianity. While Sepulveda, on the other hand, was a more secular kind of guy, and he argued that because indigenous people were not Christians, therefore they were less human, and so they could be enslaved or killed. Now, the interesting thing about this, or the tragic thing about this, is that both of these positions did not lead to the end of the domination of indigenous people, and colonization, of course, continued apace. So we can see that different arguments can be put forward, but the end is the same. In other words, to justify the domination by Europeans over non-Europeans, either by the theft of land and genocide, so Sepulveda's position, or by the forced conversion into European ways and therefore the loss of indigenous culture and lifestyle. And of course, with regards to our context here in Australia, we'll be looking into this in much greater detail later on. All right, I'm not sure I have time for questions because I have spent a lot of time. So why don't you put down any questions in the chat that you might have um, and also save them up for the tutorial. Let me go on with the lecture. All right, so if you remember at the beginning, I said that I wanted to try to break down a few common ideas about race that are out there in the world. Um, and the first one is that race is a social construct. And somebody put this on the board, uh, and Talia also mentioned it. So the first thing is, well, race is a social construct. What? So what, right? Um, what does it actually mean to say race is a social construct? I'm going to skip over this as well. So I've really, I've really gone over on my time. And next week I will make sure we have enough time for all the questions. Okay, let's break this down. The idea that race is a social construct is fundamentally an argument against accepting the terms that are set out by scientific racism. In other words, that there are essential biological differences between groups of human beings. So. We are in favor of this argument, right? Like we don't agree <laughs> that there are real biological differences between groups of human beings. And indeed, as I said earlier, scientists have proven, especially since the discovery of DNA, that there is indeed more human variation in terms of your DNA between two people, two individuals, uh, because everybody has their unique DNA, than there is between whole groups of people who might look similar to each other physically. Right, So more variation between in, among individuals, you and I, than there is between everybody who has been placed in the same racial group as myself and everybody who's been placed in the ra same racial group as, as another person. Right, So essentially the old anti-racist idea that we all belong to one race, the human race, is absolutely correct. However, according to um, the political theorist Barner Hesse, when we say race is a social construct of the biological idea of race, we don't actually dismantle the idea of biological race. In other words, it's a circular argument. We go around in a circle back to this idea that there are bi biological races and we never explain why there's a need to socially construct this idea, right? So the question really is, why do we keep repeating this like a mantra when racism still exists? What has it helped us to understand, right? Really, when it comes down to it. In fact, some people willfully misunderstand the idea of social construction, and they use it to argue that because there are no real biological differences between so-called races, that actually there's no such thing as racism. So they basically make, they, they make an equivalence between social construction and a myth, right, or a lie. And these are not the same thing. But of course, we know that racism still exists. So we must ask, is the idea of social, cons of social construction useful? The fact is that race is both a fact and a fiction, right? So it's not a fact in the biological sense, but it's a social fact, right? Social facts are built upon the fiction of race. And the point is that there are real 
and devastating outcomes for people. So I think it's better to focus on these real impacts of race rather than arguing about whether race is real or not. This is especially the case because, as we've already seen, race is not just about biology and genetics. It uses all of these different tools we said earlier, religion, culture, ethnicity, geography, and so on, in order to construct itself. And these differences are all real. So the question is, why have they been used to make the case for the domination and exploitation of billions of people, both historically and today? And when we ask this question, this why question, this how question, these two questions, it pushes us to become more specific about how is race socially constructed. So really to try to understand this, and as I say, this could be a lifelong exercise, is our aim as people who want to study race. And I hope everybody's on board to become a student of race, not just for the semester, but for four a long time to come because we need all hands on deck because this is a very, very, very difficult subject. So we need to look at how, why, and when race is socially constructed, not just historically, but today as a continual process. Cedric Robinson, again, I mentioned earlier in another book of his, uses the idea of the racial regime to show how race takes different forms at different times, depending on what the demands of the time are today. Each era or regime builds on the past and adds to old forms of race making and transforms them for new times. So things that we talk about today kind of cobble together ideas from the past and put them together and kind of produce new discourses, new languages, new practices in order to affect the same thing, which is basically to divide and manage people for the purposes of exploiting them and dominating them better. Um, and we'll look at various examples of how that works uh, later on. And this is also the point being made by uh, Sivanandan famously in this quote uh, when he talks about racism never standing still. All right, so I'm going to just signal that it's 10 to, and I have um, gone on quite a lot because I've gone quite slowly over these ideas which are relatively complex. So if I go on for five minutes longer, if you cannot stay, that's fine. It'll be recorded. But if you can, that would be wonderful. And I will try to manage the time a little bit better next week. I'm famously, everybody who studied with me knows that I'm famously somebody who always packs too much into the lecture. Um, I don't think that's going to change. I'm too old now. <laughs> All right. So the second idea I want to take on is this idea, as I said at the introduction, that racism, when it comes down to it at the end of the day, is really a problem of some individuals who insist on just being racist because they've got some kind of problem, right? And that really what we need to do is educate these people out of their ignorance um, in different ways. Um, so how can we think about this prevalent idea? To think about it, we need to think about the relationship between race and racism. So, so far I've talked a lot about race, but I haven't really talked about racism and what that is. So in most people's conception, so in general, um, generally, not everybody, but many people think that racism is an ideology based on the idea that there are different racial groups who are organized according to a hierarchy. So this idea of a hierarchy is very, very prevalent in thinking about what racism is. But again, this idea doesn't do much to explain, well, where does this come from? If there is a racial hierarchy, then why is there a racial hierarchy? What is it about? Because obviously how people look on the face of things is very arbitrary, right? It's very arbitrary that you know people who look a certain way are considered racially superior to people who look a different way. And this can shift over time, as I've said before. So this view of racism sees it as an unfortunate, but a universal attitude. The idea being that everyone really, when it comes down to it, is prejudiced against others who are different to themselves. Now, whether or not this is true, being prejudiced is not the same as being racist. Prejudice doesn't lead to domination and exploitation, and it doesn't imply the existence of races which are fixed and unchanging with no movement possible between them. So these, I want you to decouple these ideas, prejudice and racism. They're two different things. 
This view also doesn't contend with the European origins of race. So while race, yes, has become globalized as a system of rule, it doesn't do us any favors to ignore what Miri Song calls its history, severity, and power, as she argues, seeing race as kind of free floating from its history allows it to be used in a number of ways uh, that are then made equivalent to each other. And this logic leads us to something I'm sure you've all heard about, this idea of there being reverse racism or sometimes anti-white racism. So thinking about racism as being everywhere all at once and not having any particular history leads us to this idea, which is just factually incorrect. All right, the next idea is comes from treating racism as a form of ignorance that focuses too much on the individual and not enough of on systems of power. We often talk about people being either racist or non-racist, you know, that's that guy is racist or this person is really not very racist, etc. And we often think that racist people are either people with extremist views or those who are ignorant and simply uneducated. Taking this perspective means, I think, that we fail to ask, well, how do these people become racist, right? If there are racist people, and there are, right? But if this is the pinnacle of what racism is about, so-and-so being racist and another person not being racist, well, how does one person become racist and another person not racist? I mean, I don't understand that process. I mean, the question might be, can you be born a racist? I think most people would agree that you cannot. So therefore something is happening, right? Something is happening to make this part of your vision of things. When we look at things as being um, a problem of individuals, racism gets reduced to those individual people's bad attitudes. And of course, because people don't want to be thought of as being racist, they put a lot of energy into denying that they are racist. And I think that's why when we go out in the street, sometimes you'll have this thing where people ask, you know, what are your attitudes towards X group and so on? That's not very useful because nobody wants, very few people will actually admit, right, that they have racist ideas. And that it's an example is this kind of show, I think it was from 2017, SBS documentary, Is Australia Racist? Where they went out and asked all these people, what do you think about racism? Now, very briefly, I this is a comic that I, made last year and you can browse it on views but it's about this concept of not racism and down there in the right hand corner you have the yorta yorta rapper adam briggs who pointed out that sometimes calling out racism is seen as worse than the racism itself right and you'll all be familiar with this idea all right so racism is often seen as being the preserve of extremists who commit abhorrent acts of violence now while these people certainly exist and the amount of racist violence is on the rise and it's extremely serious, trying to root the problem out at the level of the individual violent extremists does not, once again, deal with the question of what happens to these people to make them racist. Perpetrators of racist atrocities are often treated as bad apples or lone wolves, you will have heard these expressions, but the fact is that these perpetrators are motivated by mainstream views, particularly on immigration and, for example, Muslim people. This was the case of Anders Breivik, who murdered over 70 young people in Norway in 2011 because he was opposed to multiculturalism. And he actually wrote this manifesto, which you can see there, a European Declaration of Independence, he called it, in which he cited many articles from mainstream newspapers that had raised, quote unquote, concerns about immigration and social co cohesion. So when we treat violent extremists as mentally ill, for example, or as lone wolves or bad apples, we turn racism into a pathology, so into a kind of a sickness, rather than being the expression of a whole culture. As the anti-colonial psychiatrist and freedom fighter Franz Fanon, who we'll meet in greater detail next week, wrote in his little essay, Racism and Culture, he wrote a colonial cult country or a country that has benefited from colonialism is racist, de facto. Therefore, the individual racist is not abnormal, mentally ill or beyond the pale. He, he or she is act, actually acting normally because they are reflecting the culture in which they live. This is an argument against seeing racism as being rare or out of the ordinary, 
as Fanon says, it's not very useful to say things like, there are a few hopeless races, but you must admit that on the whole, the population likes immigrants, for example, with time, all this will disappear. We're moving towards more progress. He goes, that, these are kind of empty statements that don't really help us to um, understand very much. So I actually used Fanon's essay to make a TikTok video. This was extremely difficult to make. I don't know how young people do TikTok very, very hard, but I did manage to make three videos. I won't be doing it again. This one is called, Is Racism a Pandemic? Which you can have a look at. And I share my ideas on this in that little video. Okay, so obviously I'm here as a teacher. So obviously I think that educating people about race and racism is absolutely vital. But there is a fallacy that this alone will end racism. People believe that more education and in particular, having better knowledge of non-dominant cultural groups will bring about an end to racism. But to say this, I think discounts the fundamental role that race plays in underpinning the social, political, and economic system that has been in development for over 500 years. In other words, it's just not that simple, right? This system that we are still living with depends on race and other structures of dominance, class, gender, so on. And it also reproduces them constantly in order to function. So ending racism, I have bad news, demands a whole system change. It cannot be merely an individual approach. So part of what we're doing is really important studying about it, but it cannot get rid of racism on its own. A lot of anti-racist action is grounded on promoting better cultural understanding between groups who are defined as being different to each other. And again, there are several possible problems with this, including the fact that again, it individualizes the problem. People knowing each other is obviously a great thing, but it doesn't bring about systemic change on its own. It could lead to dodgy things like people using their one indigenous friend, for example, as a way of justifying the racist status quo. So just to give you an anecdote, you know, somebody, uh, an Indian person was in a bar and somebody mimicked an Indian accent. And that person said, well, I don't really don't think you should do that. It's really racist. And that person goes, well, my Indian friend likes it. Right. So. That's what I'm, the kind of logic I'm referring to. People of color also who grew up in multiracial families often talk about the kind of racism that they face within their own families or even from their own parents. So again, to return to Fanon, a society that's been founded on racism will reproduce racist individuals. And as I was writing this lecture, I came across this workshop um, uh, on Eventbrite and it's an example of a well-meaning approach that stresses this kind of individual interaction. But both historically and in the present, white, black, and indigenous people do know each other, right? Often intimately. Think about enslavers who fathered the children of the people who they had enslaved. This approach, come meet a black person, also places a lot of weight on the shoulders of racialized people to open themselves up to people who may be racist towards them. So again, to struggle against racism, people must feel that their struggle is a common one and that ending racism benefits everybody and isn't just a kind of an act of benevolence on behalf of non-white people, which can be quite a patronizing attitude. All right, so sorry for going on so long, but I'm gonna take another five minutes, as I said. I've said a lot about racism, uh, what it's not, but I haven't really said at all what it is. So what is the relationship between race and racism? If race is a technology of rule for the management of human difference and a social system that positions people in relation to power and exploitation, racism we can think about as the practices that produce and reproduce race, yeah? So a good definition um, that I use and many other people refer to also is from the geographer and abolitionist activist, Ruth Wilson Gilmore, from her book on the California prison system, The Golden Gulag. And we can see in this definition that racism isn't just a matter of bad attitudes towards people who are different, neither is it just the extremist actions of lone wolves. It is about creating the conditions in which whole groups of people are made more likely to die. I'm not saying that they necessarily will die, but that the conditions are created for it to be more likely for them to die earlier, prematurely. 
Ruth Wilson Gilmore also talks about organized abandonment. In other words, if race constructs people as being less than human, they are obviously seen as being less deserving of our care and more likely to be forced to exist in conditions which leads to their lives being impoverished, which of course in turn can cause this premature death. So in other words, this is by design. And we're going to be looking at how this works in much greater detail as we go on. So lastly, let me say a few things about um, the ethics behind the subject. And I'm sure you've already got an inkling um, about my approach, right? I've adapted this idea of study and struggle from the historian Robin D.G. Kelly's article, Black Study, Black Struggle. And he argues in the article that the university, which as I said in my acknowledgement, is a colonial capitalist and racist institution, cannot be the place from within which to dismantle these unjust conditions. But it is a place where we can come together, like we are doing today, and to gather as much knowledge as we can and use this to struggle for a better world outside. So we need better racial literacy. In other words, we need better understanding of how race works, not because education is necessarily a route to progress, but because we can use knowledge as a weapon. As the black freedom fighter Asata Shakur has said, people can get used to anything. The less that you think about your oppression, the more your tolerance for it grows, and after a while, people just think that oppression is the normal state of things. So to become free, in her case, she says, you have to, have be, to be acutely aware of being a slave. In other words, knowing about what oppresses us helps us to understand the root out of it. The last thing is something I mentioned in the learning guide, um, on which is an ethos of this unit. Debate is a common technique that's used to further knowledge, but it's a technique that's grounded in a Western approach to knowledge, which assumes that we can be objective about facts. So when you're on a debating team, for example, if you've ever done that, you will be forced sometimes to argue for a position that you're absolutely opposed to in your real life. And today, common, it's common for racism also to be turned into a matter of debate. The media scholar Gavin Titley refers to the debatability of racism. When we turn the question of racism into a debate that has two evenly weighted sides, for example, for and against the wearing of hijab, for example, or whether or not there should be mandatory detention for asylum seekers, we treat questions that are really about people's lives and deaths as though they were just another interesting subject, right? So what happens is when we do this, it desensitizes us to the issue. And we can see how the approach taken by the media to racism has led to people with extreme racist and fascist views being given an equal airing, serving to legitimize what should be commonly agreed upon as being abhorrent views or being allowed to make statements that are not grounded in fact, such as something that we hear very commonly in Australia, it is illegal to seek asylum by boat, when of course, according to every single law, be it national or international, it is perfectly legal to seek asylum by any route. So in this class, we're going to unpick the questions that we look at thoroughly, and we are going to use our critical thinking to the maximum, but we will not be debating whether or not racism is real, right? We're going to take that as a given. That will free us up to spend time to explore how race works with the aim of getting rid of it. Uh, so let me go, sorry. <laughs> This is the outline of the semester. I'm not going to belabor the point. You can check out the learning guide and we'll be talking about this more in the tutorials, but it's basically divided into three sections, which you can see there with each week um, in between. Uh, the tutors for this subject are myself uh, at Kingswood and Aronima Das, who I think is here, who's going to take the tutorials at Bankstown and Parramatta. And before I let you go, I just wanted to flag up a seminar series that's going to be running alongside this subject um, and throughout the year, uh, which brings together uh, a variety of, oh, I've made a spelling mistake there, sorry, a variety of authors discussing their recent books on 
race from various perspectives and I'll be sharing more information with you about that on views. Please apologize, uh, allow me to apologize for taking up so much of your time today. I hope it's been useful. I will be shorter next week um, and I look forward to meeting some of you in tutorial. Please do email me. Um, all of the information is in the learning guide if you require any details, if there's anything unclear or if you need any help with anything at all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Thank everybody. You so